So thank you all again for tuning in uh, this evening. Um, tonight we will be talking about the Camacho uh, Distillery Edition. So we've got George Rami from uh, Camacho and Avo in the US with us uh, today to, to talk about the cigar. And also we've got the three, three whiskies, um, a porter's cake and um, the Stella Dew, which um, Nathan uh, will be talking us through a bit later on. And we'll talk about the, the pairings between the cigar and, and the whiskey. Um, I don't know if anybody from the cigar side, Paul or Mitchell, want to say anything before we uh, get going. Who to Paul? <laughs> oh, no, j just to mention that uh, I think Roy's going to record uh, the Zoom session and we'll have that sent uh, and cut and edited and we'll have it posted to the social mm. media and Cigar's mm. YouTube channel. Um, I'll talk a little bit tag, about Stella Do. Tag uh, Camacho Cigars on. and then I'll share it on my, on my platform too if possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. I'll send you the link, uh, George. Perfect. Perfect. Um, so, George, so maybe you can do um, a quick introduction about uh, yourself, and then maybe, Nathan, you can do the same after that. Sure. Oh, perfect. So, my name is George Ramy. I'm the, uh, the uh, brand ambassador for Camacho in the, in the U.S., but obviously, you know, I assist uh, globally as well whenever it's, uh, it's needed. Um, been in the industry for about 16 years. I started in retail. Then, uh, uh, you know, for the past uh, eight years, I've been with Davidoff here in the U.S. And it's, uh, you know, it was the last piece of the puzzle when uh, when we did the the, the revamp for Camacho uh, back in 2013. Uh, and then since then, it's been a journey. We've uh, transformed this brand into, you know, a global monster, basically. Uh, but here in the in the U.S., my basically my job is social media now and uh, and and activations, right? Um, Activations this year have been a little bit different than uh, than you know than previous years, but basically that is uh, my job. And now we're trying to engage through you know Zoom chats and and you know virtual events in stores and stuff like that. So um, I'm the Camacho guy um, uh, here in the U.S. And and you know whatever questions you have, you guys have, you know you can uh, reach out on uh, on Camacho Cigars at, uh, at Camacho Cigars on Instagram, and and you'll be talking to me. So you know for that's for further notice, but. Um, Today we're going to be talking about obviously the Camacho distillery, but just a little bit about you know Camacho. Uh, Camacho is a brand that started back in 1962 uh, by the gentleman Simon Camacho, right? Uh, the the brand bears his last name, and unfortunately he passed away in the uh, 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 early 90s. And in 1995, it was acquired by the Aroa family, which basically though they they were the ones that put together the name Camacho because they needed a bold name, but the brand was established in Miami at that point, uh, the Camacho, but the family didn't want to do anything to it. So the, the Aroa family acquired the brand and, and merged what we have now, which is uh, the Corojo part of, of, of the brand and the brand itself. Right. Um, so both of those things, the brand Camacho with it, with its signature Corojo, um, was launched in the year 2000 here in the U.S. and and it, it was a disruptor of the industry because prior to to that, even including that, but all cigars, uh, all cigars were mild to medium. There was no really you know stronger, bolder cigars out there. Uh, so pretty much Camacho is the one that started that that momentum here in the U.S. and you know now it, it, everything is super strong and then there's different sizes and stuff like that. So the industry has evolved since then. But Camacho, it's 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 you know and and that's our our, our slogan. We're the the, the makers of the boldest cigars in the world and that's uh that's what the brand is about so um as as we go i'll, I'll throw in a few a few more more things about the brand but in a nutshell that's uh that's that's what we have for now i'm gonna light up i don't know if you guys have the three distilleries but you know i'm gonna start up with the uh with the camacho uh connecticut distillery yeah that's the only one we have in the uk actually the really oh yep. man okay <clears throat> i've tried the ecuador as well which somebody gave to me um, well, yeah, in the UK, we only have the, uh, the Connecticut. Uh, Nathan, over to you. Just do a quick intro about yourself and, and what you do and who you represent. Yeah, great. Um, so, yeah, thank you for having me. I'm Nathan. Um, I am the National Whiskey Ambassador for a company called Specialty Brands. You now, we're an importer of various types of premium spirits, and Porter Skeg is one of the whiskies we look after. But we've also done quite a lot of work across the UK with um, whiskies like Nika, Cavalan, Amrit, Michters. So, a pretty wide portfolio. So, I kind of worked in hospitality for the last 12 years of my life and eventually kind of focused on on whiskey as the main thing. So working in whiskey bars and doing lots of whiskey tastings. And then for the last three and a half years, I've been working 
with specialty brands as the whiskey ambassador. So today we're going to focus 100% on uh, Port Skeg, which is one of the brands that we look after from Elixir Distillers. And we've got two different um, products to talk you through today. But before we talk through the whiskey, I think it's going to be cigar time. So I think if you, uh, well, while you're talking, if you, I think we start with the Port Skeg eight-year-old. Yeah, correct. I mean, if we yep. want to start with that. Yeah, I think um, if you're going to explain a little bit uh, about, about the whiskey, then we move on to, to George, so you can explain a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, of course. And the aging. And then. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the Porter Skeg, eight-year-old. Um, so the Porter Skeg brand has been around since um, 2009. Now, a lot of people ask, you know, where's the Porter Skeg distillery? Uh, Porter Skeg doesn't have a distillery. We're an independent bottler of whiskies. So Porter Skeg is owned by a company called Elixir Distillers. Uh, who is also owned for, by um, Sakinda Singh, who is the owner of the Whiskey Exchange. Now, Sakinda has been working in whiskey for the past 30, 35 years. He set up the Whiskey Exchange 20 years ago, and then he decided he was going to start trying his hand at independently bottling whiskies. Now, 20 years ago, it was much easier to do this than it is today. Getting casks from every distillery in Scotland is pretty much a nightmare now. So everything that we do at Port Skeg has been a long struggle to get to this point. So Sikinda started off um, with a brand called the Single Malts of Scotland. Now you can still find these brands today in their single cask, cask strength versions of all different single malts from all over Scotland. But then Sikinda tried to do something a little bit different, which hadn't really been done before in 2005, 2006. And that was to start releasing whiskies that weren't based on vintage and weren't based on age statement. So we released a range of whiskies that looked a little bit like this. So you might have seen these before. These are the elements of Isla. Now, at this time, you know, 15 years ago, whiskies would have had, you know, whiskey name, age, type of cask, vintage. And that was what people thought, like, right, okay, a 20-year-old is going to be, you know, twice as good as a 10-year-old. A 5-year-old is going to be terrible. And the kind of decided he wanted to try and break that mold. So he started doing releases like this. So this is OC3. So OC is optimal and three is the third release of that. Now, these were really, really well-received products and people kind of did start moving away from just choosing age um, or just choosing a vintage. But the problem that he had was all of these elements of Isla were really, really intense, very niche, very unique spirits. Now for novice whiskey drinkers or for people that weren't used to big PT Isla whiskies, this was a bit of a problem. So for three, four years, he decided he was going to just do this and then he was going to try and branch out a little bit. And this is where the idea for Port Skeg came from. Now the name Port Skeg, it refers to the main port in Isla. Now if you go to Isla, you can either go by uh, the air and you can fly into Isla Airport or you can go by boat. And if you go by boat, the two options you have is to go into Port Ellen, which is a slightly smaller port, or you go into Port Escape. So Port Escape is the entryway to Isla. It's kind of your first experience of Isla. And this kind of sets the tone for the whole brand. The idea with Port Escape is that it's approachable, easy drinking, gateway to Isla whiskey. So even if you maybe haven't tried a lot of peated whiskey or you are completely against peated whiskey, if you try Port Escape, the chances are it's going to be a bit more approachable than everything you've had before. So the way that they choose, or the way that we bottle Porter Skeg, it's quality, quality, quality. So just because it's an eight-year-old whiskey, it doesn't mean that it's an inferior product to a 12-year-old or a 15-year-old. It just means that this eight-year-old whiskey has basically reached the highest point of maturation that we feel we want at this, this price point. So a lot of people think it's a bit of a secret where we get all the whiskeys from. I'll be completely honest with you, about 85% of the whiskies that we bottle with Porter Skeg come from the distillery that is closest to Porter Skeg, which is Kulila. Now, there's a few reasons for this. Kulila has a huge distillery. It's about 6 million litres per year capacity. Diageo certainly do not need all of that Porter Skeg. So a lot of Porter Skeg gets sold off for blends. A lot of it gets sold by the tanker onto the mainland, and some of it gets sold straight into casks onto Isla. Now, we buy quite a lot of Kulila. Uh, one, because it's very, very affordable. It's amazing value for money. But two, it's such a brilliant spirit to drink when it's young. It's really, really citrusy, really, really fresh. You've got this beautiful kind of seaweed, citrusy, almost kind of rocky granite notes on there. And it doesn't need a huge amount of aging. If we flip to something like Lagavulin that's a bit heavier, then you might find that it needs a bit more than eight years, 10 years. You might need to go up to sort of 15 years to get something as elegant. So the Portskeg eight-year-old, 
is Kulila, um, that's been in the barrel for a minimum of eight years, probably around eight to 10 years. And all the barrels we use here are quite well used hogsheads. So when you pour it out, you can see the color is really, really light. Now that's because the barrels haven't been used or they have been used quite a lot. So if we were to say, put a sherry cask in there for eight years, it's gonna be much darker. If we were to use a first fill barrel, it's gonna be darker again. But the idea with Port Skeg is to keep the integrity of the Kulila distillery in there. So yeah, we've got eight year old Port Skeg here. It's at 45.8%. And everyone asks why 45.8? So that is the lowest ABV we can get to without having to chill filter the whiskey. If you speak to a guy called Ollie Chilton, who's our um, head blender, if you mention chill filtration, he'll kick you out of the office. So this is one thing that he really, really is against in whiskey. Uh, and for anyone that's not familiar with chill filtration, essentially um, you have lots and lots of different compounds in the whiskey that um, are all kind of in suspension. If you chill the whiskey down in a certain way, so if that's in transport or if that's with ice or with cold water, you can start to make these oils and different compounds clump together and you can get the whiskey going a bit hazy. To combat that, you can chill the whiskey down and pass it through a big sieve or a big filter and you will trap all of these kind of more um, obvious clump together compounds and you'll end up with a whiskey that's a lot more stable and a lot more clear even in colder temperatures. By doing this, you're removing quite a bit of the flavor from some of the whiskies. So we choose not to do it. And 45.8% is the lowest ABV we've figured out how to kind of get to so that we don't have to chill filter the whiskey. And Port Escape will always be non-chill filtered and no coloring added to it as well. So enjoy the eight-year-old. If anyone's got any questions at all, then please give me a So shout. You, get, you guys are tasting three different ones? <clears throat> yep. I think three, nice. Yeah, nice, nice, nice. Uh, yeah, Porter's Cake, eight year old, uh, the 100 proof, and then uh, Stella Du, which is a Chicago's uh, all in. Is, is, are yeah. those, is it, are they sold here in the US by any chance? Porter's Cake, 800 proof, definitely in the US. Um, What's the price point on something like that? So the eight year old in the US uh, is probably about 70 to $75, and the 100 proof okay. about 80 to 85. Oh, okay. All right, so it's, uh, it's decently priced. That's good. Yeah, because I saw the picture, I'm like, mm, how can I get a hold of these so I can do this, this with you guys? But it was just, I couldn't, I, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't uh, uh, get around because um, I have a, a, a baby, you know, I, we just had a baby. So it's just, it consumes the entire, your, all your time. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah. I, can't even, I can't even go to a liquor store now. Um, yeah, whiskey's yeah, so low I'll, in I'll priority have, list when yeah, you have a baby. Very, very. <laughs> I had to just dig into uh, my, uh, my, um, my cabinet here and, and I'm, I'm pairing it with a, a peerless rye whiskey, right? Uh, and this one, this one's pretty good. I did a, a live show with uh, Bourbon Blog, and then they, they sent me these. But this one's amazing. It's not probably not the experience that you guys are having, but at least I'm trying to fit in, right? <laughs> and it's 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 one fourteen here, so mm, by the time we finish, <laughs> it'll be a, a an early day for me. <laughs> Nap time, yeah. Yeah, no, and it's my my uh, my my wife's birthday, so. You know, we'll have some oh, people over later. So, you know, I'm just exactly. kind of setting the tone here. Absolutely. <laughs> um, we'll move to you, uh, George, and then talk a little bit more about, uh, about the cigar, about uh, how did the uh, distillery edition come about? And uh, you mentioned in the beginning there's three different kinds, even though we only get to yeah. get in, in, in the UK. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, uh, let me just step it back a little bit and, and kind of put together the brand, right? Camacho and the Corojo. So Corojo was uh, the, the tobacco used mostly for wrapper uh, for, you know, it was, it was used in Cuba, right? It was, uh, it was created by Daniel Rodriguez in, um, in, in Pinal de Rio, Cuba. And it's what Cuban cigars pretty much had um, the wrapper that they were using on it in its heyday, right? In the eighties, nineties. And then they had, a, they suffered a, 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 a just a, a blue mold, uh, uh, you know, epidemic on their on their on their plant, so they had to create a um, a hybrid seed, right? So at that point, it was no longer you know original Corojo, and that was in the mid '90s. Now, in the '60s, in 1964, if I'm not wrong, is when just the whole you know nationalization happened with Cuba and all that stuff. So the growers had to flee Cuba with their with the with seeds basically, right? And uh, and that's why a lot of you know the manufacturers that you have now they have Cuban uh, Cuban origins and stuff like that. So they're 
if they're a couple generations back, uh, those were the guys that had the uh, pretty much the, the the duty of taking those seeds out and 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 continue the growth of this uh, of this of these strains. Range, right uh, in this case uh, the corojo so the corojo was was pretty much taken to mesoamerica basically they tried to grow corojo in, in mexico and in different parts of central america and then they narrowed it down and this is something that was trial and error and it took decades of uh, of, of trial and error uh because it's a very uh susceptible uh, uh, strain to to diseases and molds and stuff like that you know given that it, it was just the original strain it did not have the hybrid uh Pretty much the vaccines, um, uh, sort of call it um, the one that the disease that were taken from uh, from uh, from Cuba down into Mesoamerica. So they narrowed it down to Honduras, right? And it's it's not Honduras, but it's uh it's the the, the Hamastran Valley and that volcanic area that Nicaragua and Honduras Honduras share, and that's where pretty much the Corojo flourishes, right? Uh, pretty much you get about a ninety five percent yield on the plant, which is that is very good. Uh, and when you when you plant corojo, you're planting with hopes you're gonna get mostly wrapper. It's not always the case because the plant, different parts of the plant, uh, depending on how, even if it's a you know a fifth priming, and but the plant did not really you know gave its best. That 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 uh, fifth priming is probably not gonna be used as wrapper, right? So you plant for wrapper, but you use what you get. So basically, uh, it's that this is a very uh, 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 high yield plant so so we use most of the plant even going back to the the boldest cigars in the world a person that's going to make a milder cigar wouldn't even think about using the corona side which is the six priming on the plant um and that the those leaves get exposed to the elements a lot longer right so when you prime from the bottom up um these these three to four leaves smaller leaves will be uh will be affected by the elements so they're very rich in terms of nutrients and and, and flavor and everything so it, that's that's what we use in some of some parts of the filler to give that extra kick uh uh that makes camacho a uh, uh you know it gives it the signature kick right the signature taste but why though I'm, I'm trying to explain the corojo because all of our cigars have corojo right either in the wrapper binder filler, wherever it's, uh, we, they have Corojo, different percentages. But for example, on this Connecticut, <clears throat> Connecticut, our, our regular core line, it's our best selling line, you know, going back to in the, the, the masses smoke mild to medium cigars, right? Um, there is a market obviously for bolder cigars, but you know, the, the just the, in general, uh, uh, the numbers don't lie, our Camacho Connecticut, which is our mildest one, it's the one that sells the most, right? So, and that one does have Corojo. So the Camacho Connecticut has been around since uh, 2009. That was the first venture between Camacho and the previous owners, which is the Aroa family. Um, so we use, the best tobaccos from both countries to try to come up with a, with a milder blend, right? That was not the, the your typical Camacho from 2000 to 2008, which it was bold cigars, right? Um, so the 2000, in 2009, the Camacho Connecticut was born. <clears throat> and then on to 2015, when we came out, 16, when we, 17, when we came out with the distillery edition, we only had that core line, right? And then we have the distillery. Um, I'm going to explain the distillery in a second. Then we had the Camacho Ecuador, right? The Ecuador was back in 2016 um, to try to fill a, a, a gap in our portfolio, right? So we wanted a blend that had a little bit of, 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 of floral notes, some citrusy uh, notes, a little bit of pepper. So we started using the, the, you know, some Brazilian tobacco in it that gave it those floral notes. So that was the Camacho uh, Ecuador. Right, and then we have our Camacho, which is this one here, the Camacho Ecuador. Unfortunately, you guys don't have it over there. And then we have our Corojo. Now, this is a hundred percent Honduran Corojo, right? The seed that we've been protecting for the last forty years, um, you know, perfecting, protecting it, just you know, uh, uh, using that 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 same Cubanesque flavor profile for our cigars. Um, this is the Camacho. Corojo uh, distillery. Now, what we did with the distillery edition, which is pretty much we used in our last chat, we had uh, we were featuring the uh, Nicaraguan barrel age and the American barrel age, right? Which is a process that we use of of of, uh, of aging our tobacco, not infusing it. We're not pumping any any uh, any bourbon in, in there or, or or rum in the Nicaraguan uh, side of things. But these are aged in um, one part of the filler, which is the Corojo. 
it's aged in the uh, bourbon barrels for six months, right? Just to give it that nice little hint of it. Uh, of, uh, but the, ori the blends are the original ones. The blend that, that I described in, in 2009, the Connecticut, that is our best-selling cigar, the Ecuador, the Corojo, those are the same blends. Now we grabbed a little bit of the filler, which is usually one leaf, right? And we put them inside these uh, these bourbon barrels, right? Uh, at some point, we were using a uh, uh, bullet bourbon. We've used uh, uh, Jim Beam. Uh, I can't name some other ones, but um, they stay in there for six months. And every two weeks, the guys come open up the the barrels, switch the tobacco around, so that everything has a ferment the standard fermentation process as it, as they would have in a uh, in a traditional bale, right? So that gives it uh, some nuance of flavor that then is added into the, uh, the recipe to make the distillery addition. So basically, if you're a, a Camacho Connecticut lover, you know, that, that you've been smoking it since 2009, that is the Camacho that you like. This one will give you the same flavor profile, so you won't be alarmed that it's a different cigar, but it will give, you know, a different taste, uh, something new to the blend that uh that for the most part has been very uh, very successful some other people are very you know stubborn and they want what they want and then they want the quality and consistency just like they do with davidoff cigars you know um and but you know it, it's been a very fun project to be able to to kind of pair this with uh with uh with the same process that we use for our our, our some of our best sellers which is the american barrel aids and the Nicaraguan barrel aids so pretty much what we did we grabbed the same blends that have been you know our core lines that that are you know sell very well for us and, and have a, a great audience around the world and tweaked it and we added that bourbon uh, uh, aging um, process to it that just kind of like tweaked the blend a little bit to make it a little bit more entertaining. Instead of coming out with a new cigar, uh, we decided to come up with a distillery edition, which is just, you know, it only comes in one size, which is the Toro size. And we believe the Toro size, when you're going to experiment with the blend, is the, it's the best size to kind of, you know, throw out there and, uh, and, and have people enjoy it. So it only comes in one size, the, uh, the 6x50 Toro. Uh, and like I said, it's the same blends, just kind of tweaked a little bit with that aging six months in the, uh, in the barrels. And now we use, we do six months for American barrel age and the ground barrel age. We use five, we, we do it for five, we age it for five months. Why six months? Because the amounts of tobacco that are actually used in the filler and, 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 um, and, in each one of the of the lines it needed a little bit you know more and this is trial and error right so the distillery was in challenge we started doing the distillery uh trial and error when we started doing um back in 2015 actually so the idea was to do the american barrel age and then what what else what are we gonna do what's 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 next right we did the rum one which is the nicaraguan barrel age but the distiller was already in the works uh we were kind of you know just just Thinking about how the, 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 the consumer would react as to having a just a regular Camacho and then just adding the bourbon. So we wanted to wait until we had established the rum, the Nicaraguan barrel age, and the American barrel age to launch this one. So this is, there was a lot of trial and error. So we decided to use just one little piece of the, uh, of, uh, which is a very small uh, part of, uh, of, of the filler and age it in these barrels, but still gives it that nice and that extra month gives that nice little uh, tweak that we were looking for. So um, unfortunately, I, it's just, you guys have not probably tried the other ones, but each one is a different experience, right? The mildest one being the, uh, the Connecticut, I believe that in terms of aroma and flavor, uh, you can pick it up a lot more on this one than you would on some of the other ones due to the fact that they have bolder tobaccos, right? The Nicaragua one and uh, the Nicaragua, the, the Ecuador and the Corojo are, are you know, spicier, bolder. Uh, it, you get a lot more citrus. You get a lot more going on on the strains that were, are used in those blends. Um, but I think the Camacho, the Connecticut one is the uh, the best one when it comes to tasting the, 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 the just the tweaks that we did to the, to the blend. <laughs> Which uh, which bourbon was used for the for, for the aging? Is it? Uh, I assume it's, it's the same bourbon as the American barrel aged. Is it a different bourbon? Uh, <clears throat> it is. You could pretty much use any bourbon, right? Because it's so subtle. What the uh, what the, the 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 impact that it has on the uh, on the tobacco, right? If we were to use, I don't, I don't know. I would say fifty percent of the filler of this tobacco, then yeah, it would probably matter which, which bourbon you would use. But it's just, it's just so subtle that it's getting pretty much the main characteristics 
of, of the bourbon. And we've used, like I said, you know, uh, we've used <clears throat> Bullet Bourbon before, which is, you know, one of my favorites yeah. here. And uh, Jim Beam, right? And then what's, what was the other one that, that, that we used? I think we used Buffalo Trace. But the ones that I, can, I, I am certain because I saw the barrels, it's uh, um, the Bullet Bourbon and the gym beam right and and once you open up and i was thinking i had i had some pictures to show but uh once you open up the barrel that aroma you know it's so pungent that it, it just it just it, it becomes a, a sensory experience because you're looking at this you open it it smells you can almost taste it right um and then you get that tobacco and though you get the i would say that when these are freshly rolled which is in terms of quality and then in consumer acceptance, it may be a little too harsh, but the, when they're freshly rolled right off the, 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 the rolling uh, floor with, with the bourbon uh, aged tobacco in there, you can really taste it and possibly even smell it. Now, that's, that may be a little too much for the consumer. They would think it's infused. They would confuse it with Drew Estate, blah, 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 but that's not the case. Um, but I think it, it just, it, it, quite the experience, right? And with Camp Camacho, which I'm wearing the shirt now, uh, we get, our consumers get to experience that when we take them down to the factory and then you see all these 50, 60 barrels that are just aging there and we open up one, it takes three guys to open up the barrels and it's just the whole process and that happens every two weeks. Um, the, the aroma that just kind of like, you know, surrounds the atmosphere once you open up that barrel, it's just, just it's quite the experience. Um, and I think, like I said, it, the, the Connecticut is the one where you get to experience that combination of, 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 of flavor and aroma uh, a lot more. And how many times are the, le the leaves uh, changed in the barrels? Because I would, I would imagine they, they turn them, the leaves? They turn them. So basically the standard fermentation is it happens natural. Right, literally, tobacco on top of, of, of each other. They create the in the in the in the, the, the core of it. It create it can create a, a temperature up to a hundred. Well, you could some people heat it up just to to fast forward the process, but naturally it will create anywhere from a hundred and five to a hundred and twenty degrees temperature in there. Right. Um, we have to make sure that whatever is on the barrel, which is up enough to about make about six thousand cigars. We have to make sure that whatever was on the top or bottom makes it to the center because that's where the magic happens. So it's just a tedious process that they have, you know, spreadsheets and things. So they have to make sure that X amount of leaves, maybe uh, five layers are the top ones. And then those, they have to rotate them. So they have to undo the barrel. And it's a, it's a process that takes six months, twice a week, but we are able to pretty much get the devil's cut out of the barrel only twice. After that, the, uh, the barrels are retired because the tobacco already absorbed everything that the barrel could, uh, could, you know, could give to it. Um, but yeah, so th basically that, that's just it's what the tobacco is getting. It's getting the, uh, absorbing the devil's cut out of the barrel. Um, and that happens you know, twice a week. I'm sorry, every two weeks for, the, for, for six months. So it's, it's a tedious process, but the result is something that I think it's, uh, it's quite entertaining for the consumer. So we're pairing it with, um, with with the Polish cake whiskey, which is a bit peated. So, in my opinion, that kind of counteracts a little bit of sweetness the cigar has, mm -hmm. which, which yes. I find quite nice. Very creamy, yeah, very sweet, yep. Um, but what would you normally say as a uh, as alternative uh, pairing suggestions? I guess bourbon is is, is quite an obvious one. I Bur guess bourbon um, would but be maybe a, something uh, which is a little bit out there, like we're doing with with with, with peated whiskey. You know, is there something you've tried with okay, that shouldn't work, but it does really I, work? I, I've become a tequila uh, oh. <laughs> uh, <I> sipper, <laughs> and I've had it with. Um, I mean, this this may be a little bit out of of, of, of of budget for for a lot of people, but we were able to you know score a couple bottles of of Don Julio nineteen forty two. Okay, yeah. right. Um, and then there's another one that is uh, it's very sweet as well. It's called Sin Coro, right? I believe uh, it, I believe Michael Jordan has some sort of involved okay. in that brand but it's very sweet right so in, in the 1942 it's also very sweet very mellow it doesn't give you that pungency that the, the just any other tequila would give you um so yeah tequila would be another option but my my go-to would be i usually don't like rye but this peerless uh brand uh rye it's pretty good if not you know if i'm gonna go to the bar just a safe bet uh most likely everybody here ha carries a bullet bourbon so i, I would go with, with with bourbon yeah right um, I think it, because this one, it's, it's on the milder side. So anything that may disrupt that 
it may overpower the uh, the cigar, and at that point, then you don't have a parity, right? You have yeah. a, 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 an even battle. Sure. Um, I think we're going to go back to to Nathan for a bit and talk about uh, the second whiskey, which is the uh, 100, 100 proof. Yeah, absolutely. So. <laughs> The Portuguese eight-year-old is, like I said, the the edge of the flagship. Um, but there's there was always a bit of a demand, especially about ten years ago. We really started to see an increase in people looking for cask strength whiskies, indie bottling cask strength, and especially Isla cask strength whiskies. Now, if you go to you know the distillery releases of say Kulila or Lafroig or Lagavulin, and you're looking for these cask strengths and normally distillery only editions. They could be 90, 100, 150, all the way up to kind of like three, 400 pounds just for a whiskey that's at a higher ABV. So Ollie and Zakinda both decided they wanted to bring out something that was you know, slightly higher price point to the uh, Portscape 8, but had that same style. And it just was a way to really showcase how ABV affects a spirit. So the Portscape 100 proof is the old imperial proof. So it's 57.1% ABV. Um, and this is what 100 proof used to be in the old British system. In the US system, proof is just double ABV. Um, so that's a bit easier to work out. But the Portskeg uh, 100 proof is the same makeup in terms of casks and distillery as the Portskeg 8. So we took Kulila uh, off Isla in a tanker. We filled it into our barrels in uh, just outside Glasgow, and then it sits in the warehouse for sort of between seven and 10 years for this one. So again, very, very well used hogsheads. But I think the key thing to kind of think about with this is these whiskies are almost identical, apart from one is, you know, 15% or 14% higher. Now on the palate, a high strength whiskey or a high strength whiskey is in one, in some ways it can kind of feel uh, a lot creamier. Uh, it can also feel a lot more cooling because obviously alcohol is a solvent. So some people are a little bit wary about super high strength alcohol. I think when you've got really high quality spirits like Kulila make, having it at cask strength or even straight off the still at like 70% ABV, you can still drink it. Now, if you want to add a little bit of water to it, by all means, go for that. I'd recommend trying it neat first. So I think the nicest or well, my favorite way of drinking whiskey is, is cask strength whiskey. It could be because I drink whiskey for a living. Um, I've told my mum it's a real job a million times, but she still doesn't believe me. That's my excuse um, with cigars. <laughs> <laughs> totally, right? It's exactly the same thing. It's, like, it's real, don't worry. Mm -hmm. So when you've got something um, at cask strength or as close to cask strength as possible and non-chill filtered, you've got pretty much the purest expression of what's going to come out of the cask, the purest expression of that whiskey. So there's been no water added to it. We've not taken anything away. We've literally emptied the cask and then we've put it straight into the bottle. So with no coloring, with no kind of, you know, we, we haven't taken anything away from the organic compounds that have been created with the marriage of the whiskey inside the cask. Now that's why I like cast strength whiskey. And, you know, it takes less cast strength whiskey to do the same thing that we're all aiming to do anyway. So that's also the other way. But I think pairing this one with cigars, uh, some cigars, it might be uh, a bit overpowering because again, we're looking at Kulila. So Kulila is, um, it's a fairly heavily peated whiskey. The PPM on Kulila is between 37 and 44 parts per million. But um, if you compare that to Lagavulin, so like Kulila's sister distillery, they use the exact same barley, but the style of distillation and the shape of the pot stills influence the character of the whiskey hugely. So you've got the same barley. Kulila have much bigger pot stills. They fill them lower and you have a lot more reflux, a lot more recondensing of the spirit in the still. So you end up with something really grassy, really light and really green. Whereas with Lagavulin, you end up with something a lot more oily, a lot more rich. So Kulila at cask strength is a lot easier to drink, I was think, than, uh, than Lagavulin. But on the nose with this whiskey, I tend to always find a little bit more kind of white chocolate. You still get a lot of this citrus character, a lot of the salty seaside. It's quite maritime, but you do get this kind of multi chocolatey, almost Malteser note coming through as well. And I think for 57%, it's a really easy whiskey to drink. I think it pairs pretty well with the cigar in my, my previous endeavors. Banana split, yeah, that's a good tasting, 100%. <laughs> Can always rely on uh, Toby to throw, uh, to throw something in there. Um, okay, going back to, um, back to George. 
for, for a bit. Um, are there any other plans for, for distillery additions coming into to the market going forward? <clears throat> um, I don't think it's going to be under distillery, right? So we may venture off into, into different spirits, right? Uh, uh, it, I, I don't be, yeah. yeah, that, that could be an option. I, all these, you know, just to launch, uh, as you guys are well aware, Davidoff, it's a, it's a big company, right? So it's a big giant. So everything happens slowly because it's, there's a lot of processes and stuff. So I could say, yes, we're going to come out with a tequila, but then like, with a tequila infused cigar per se. And, and then, you know, it changes in, in two years when it's launched or something. Right. Um, but I think the, the, as of right now, having five, uh, uh, products that are in, in, you know pretty much aged in, in, in bourbon and, and rum it's, it's I, I think if, if we were to do something you know immediate it would be an overkill right it would be a little yeah. too much yeah. so for now I think I think we're, we're good with what we have you know the distilleries and, and, and ABA and, and NBA but I, I, I don't see anything let's just say for 2021 right maybe 2022 something else comes along uh which is in the in the in the works as well but i think that for for now we're going to stick to these they're doing well you know is there's no need to just create another another uh facing um these are doing very well uh, and and it's just the idea <clears throat> of having the distillery for example is to push our core right we've throughout the years and experience and everything we've uh, pretty much noticed that coming out with new cigars especially here in the u.s where we have the our you know, FDA friends, that it's just a problem to, you know, come up with new, with new lines, so on and so forth. So I think the best thing to do is the reinforcement of, uh, of, of our core line, right? Which is the perfect example here. The, um, the Connecticut, Ecuador, and, uh, and Corojo, because that fits into whatever the FDA is requiring, right? Basically, it's the same blend. We just use a added process to the blend so there's no change the change in flavor but there's no change in, in terms of what the blend represents right or the components of the blend so that's kind of like the way around it so to come out with a another one we would probably have to grab i don't know just for for sake of of, of making a, a a point pick a grab our, our criollo and then use part of the filler with tequila right so that wouldn't make sense so we have to make sure that whatever if we're going to move forward and do another uh, 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 a, a barrel aged um, cigar, it makes sense, right? Uh, and at that point, I don't know if 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 the market would be able to to hold to you know these three distilleries plus the ABA and the MBA. Maybe one of them would have to retire to kind of re, re you know revamp the barrel aging process, but without, you know, saturating the market as well. Uh, but for now, these are, these are doing, you know, outstanding. There's great ways of pairing it. Um, it's, 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 you know, it's just, it's been a, a fun ride, but I think that for now we are, you know, we're, we're where we need to be in terms of, of barrel aging. Um, but a tequila one would be outstanding. You know, I, I, I don't think anybody else has done anything like that, that I know of. Uh, and if, they have i i i i I, you know i would love to try it but no for the for the for the meantime this is this is what we have a i'm not quite sure why do you guys not get the other two in the uk Uh, it's not only the uk i think i think um this was the only one made available to us i'm not quite sure if it's a europe thing or the other two only available in the us i think the connecticut is only uh only in europe yeah uh okay that but I, I still don't, you know, I don't know why that that would be the case. You know what I mean? I mean, we still make them. Uh, oh, yeah. Boxes are ready. <laughs> you know, if, if it's ready. It's not that we would have to prepare something new for no, the no, game, sure, but, sure. It, you know, but I'm, I'm sure there's there's a reason why the, the other two were not available. But unfortunately, that's how you get to see the trilogy of this experience, right? The uh, Of the barrel aging of our core lines, which are, you know, very well established blends just with this tweak that I was talking about. Um, it, it's unfortunate, but if you guys ever travel or are able to order online or however, try these other two, um, which are just, 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 you know, out, outstanding blends. You know? And, and, and like I said, only in the, in the Toro size, because that's the best size 
pretty much you can uh, you can uh, get to taste the the barrel aging. Uh, a robusta would have been a little too powerful, and a Churchill it, it just wouldn't have worked. Um, I think Tom had a question. Tom. Yeah. Hi again, um, George. What do you reckon the um, competition is for C the Camacho uh, Distillery and the MBA? ABA and the late hour as well. Do you think it's the it's Podomo and the new diesel cigars? And how uh, do you compare? In yeah, the I mean, I, I think General Cigars had a, a, a another one that they 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 well, they, I mean, it's still out in the market. I think it's called Diesel, or they did a, a diesel. yeah the whiskey yeah. one. Yeah, I've personally had it, uh, not because I, I, I work for Dabo, but the, it's just terrible. <laughs> right, I, it was just way too much. It was terrible. I did not like it. Um, then Drew State had a uh, a poppy Van Winkle infused one. Um, yeah. I got to try th their first releases, but I believe that they messed up, and those releases were just uh, it was a little too much because it was also terrible. <clears throat> right, um, I, I did not like it. But then again, I've, I've had two of those. You know, I don't know if they you know kind of like uh, because this is this is this is what happens. They launched a product that they had not tested the blends in. They 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 didn't fine tune the recipe, right? And and that's why I, at least they get. That's my opinion of uh, of 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 those cigars in particular. Um, I think Perdomo uh, Diesel from from General. Um, you have uh, uh, the Drew State with with that poppy one, and I'm. I'm I'm, I'm quite. I'm, I'm leaving another one out there that I can't recall right now. But there is. A, there's some other ones out there, right? Uh, but there's a difference between in, almost infusing the cigar with the with whatever you know spirit of choice, and then just aging part of it. You know, uh, so that it gives you a subtle uh, taste profile that uh, that that tweaks the blend. But and that and that's what we do. You know, so we just want whatever. However, we're gonna tweak the blend. It has to be very subtle. Right, uh, especially on our core lines, because the idea is to offer a new, you know, a new avenue to our already established smokers of these three blends in particular. You know, um, and 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 back in 2015 with the American Barrel Age, that was just uh, uh, a, a it, it had this wow factor around it, because even though I believe uh, there was a couple other ones out in the market, I it was actually uh, Perdomo had a a some sort of barrel age one uh, at the moment. And just the way that our blend came out after, you know, a couple of years of trial and error, it, it's, it's, it, it was perceived by the, uh, by the consumer a lot better than the Perdomo did. Right. Um, it also depends on the marketing, you know, that, that you have behind it. We, uh, we, we push really hard for American barrel age and, and, you know, we, we pretty much tripled our budget that we had that year and that one in particular. So it, it depends, but, you know, in terms of competition, we, we see the competition as competition just because we are sharing the same consumer, right? But we're not trying to come out with the same product just to try to, you know, put a different ban on it and, 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 and take that away from the consumer. We want to give the consumer a choice. Uh, we're very innovative with the processes that we use, not that we reinvented the wheel with the barrel aging process, um, but I think we've, we fine tuned it to where it works with us. And that applies to, you know, Camacho and, uh, and, and the Davidoff one as well, the, the, the late hour. I'm not really, you know, up at just where, how the, 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 the blend is composed of and, and what, what tobacco is aged in the, in the barrels for the late hour. But, uh, but the idea is the same, right? To create something new, to try to bring, it, pretty much you open the door and you want the consumer to walk in. You don't want to just push them in, you know. Um, that, that's, that's basically the idea, at least for, for, for Camacho. And how long's the uh, tobacco aged in the distillery edition? Because the ABA, which I'm going to have next, is a uh, what's that? Five months. Six, <laughs> but six year. But it's a six year aged cigar. So um, it's a six year, and and that changes a little bit with uh, with the um, <clears throat> with the distillery edition, right? So the distillery edition is the same blend as the original. Uh, 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 Connecticut, for example, right? It's the same blend. So, however, for as long those tobaccos were, were aged, right, we did not change that recipe, right? So, we just grabbed, because all of our cigars have Corojo in it, we grabbed the Corojo, and that's the one that we aged in the barrel, right? So, most likely, 
the Corojo that is aged in the uh, barrel to make the distillery edition Connecticut, uh, it's about four, four years old, right? Um, and that, that, that's usually, it's most likely the same for, for all three lines because that's just the way the recipe is in our, in our regular production, uh, Corojo, Ecuador, and Connecticut. So, so basically that's what it is. There's no change in, in, in aging uh, the blend in general to achieve this, this, uh, this, you know, this nuance that we, uh, that the barrel aging process uh, uh, produces. But um, yeah, so I would say about, about four years of, of, of whichever, you know, the, the component of, of the Corojo component of the cigar um, has been aged. That, that's, that's pretty much, it's about four years, uh, which is different than the uh, ABA and NBA. Perfect. Um, so out of the, all the, um, the barrel aged ones, which one would be your favorite? The Connecticut. Connecticut, yeah. Yeah, because it's the one that, like I said, you get to smell, you know, taste a little bit of that nuance. It's uh, just that barrel aging. So it, it increases a little bit of the sweetness of the blend, which is already creamy as it is. So I think it's, uh, and, and in terms of the, the aroma that uh, that you get from the cigar, you get that, those hints of bourbon, right? That it's that, that I think they're, they're, they're more palpable when it comes to the, uh, the Connecticut because the other ones... <clears throat> Like the uh, Corojo, for example, this one, the smell and everything, you get a lot more, more pepper, some leathery notes because of the way that the tobacco, the way the blend it's composed, right? So you yeah. get bolder tobaccos. Uh, like I was explaining, the the, cr the, the priming of the plant, you get a, a tobacco that is from higher up in the plant. So that kind of like overpowers a little bit. You still get it. But in my opinion, uh, and we have diehard fans of, the, uh, of, of each one of these, um, but in my opinion, I think it's a Connecticut um, plus, it's a, it's such an easy cigar to smoke at any time of the day, right? Uh, this one you can light it up in the morning, no problem. It could be your last smoke of the day between you know at lunch or whatever it is. It's a very pleasant, it's a very easy going cigar, and it's uh, it, 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 it's it's it, it makes itself available to any palate, you know. <clears throat> Let's see if we can uh, get some of the people on the call to uh, to talk about the pairing, what they think of the cigar and the whiskey. Any thoughts from anyone? Toby, you're never shy. Oh dear. Sure. Hello everyone. How are we doing? Hey, thanks. Hi, Tobias. Hello. Sorry I was late. But the shooting ground held me up. Uh, I think, guys, the the hundred percent the the hundred proof is brilliant with the middle of this cigar. It's brilliant, the creaminess and what Nathan was saying is is, is fantastic, but it's uh, fairly young colilas with the sweetness. The tiny bit of smoke is brilliant with the middle. It's just a creaminess. It's perfect match. So well done. I quite like it. I mean, obviously I have to. No, joking. <laughs> Fantastic. It's, it's, it's bang on. And Nathan was so right on that. Cutting this down with water, it's not worth it. It's brilliant. How to keep it higher and to keep that nice creaminess. And it's perfect with the cigar. So actually, it's a good sales point. Well done. Yeah, I don't think the uh, the hundred the hundred is that uh, that harsh at all. To be honest, it, it's quite. Uh, it sits quite nice on the palate. Okay, on this. If you use a different, I, I, we've all tasted like m much stronger whiskeys. We've probably tasted yeah. lots of different distilleries too. But Kulila for me, it's to drink whiskey straight off the still. Sometimes it's a great experience. Sometimes it's the worst experience. But Kulila, you can just be like, yeah, this is finished. Don't even put it in the barrel. We can just take bottles of this now. What's the what's the production on on those? Is it a, a limited run? I mean, you said they were available. Some of those, I think, I believe, the, here in the U.S. But what's the production? So Portscape is so the eight and the hundred proof. Um, they were designed to be always available. So kind of key products that you'll always be able to find and find in multiple places all over the world. As we go up in price and in. Um, age with with their port escape they become slightly limited releases so yeah you know once a year we tend to do a kind of like a 14 or a 15 occasionally we'll do a 30 year old the 14 and the 15 th th 30 year old you said yeah the oldest wow. uh port escape we've done is a 45 year old so that was what what, what I, I, it's just it's just a question that i when i went to uh to uh to bourbon trail in kentucky i saw it and i went inside and they had this display with the barrels and and how much of the a thirty year old? How much has been the angel share, and what's the devil's gut, and what can you actually bottle? Is it <laughs> one fourth of the barrel at that point after thirty years? Half, it's probably about yeah. You're looking at a quarter, but each cask is different, right? So you yeah. have 
you know, if, if we're talking about bourbon, one, it's a first fill cask, so it tends to be a bit leakier mm-hmm. when you first have it. Yeah. But also, you're losing 5 to 8% per year in Kentucky to the angels. The benefit of that in Kentucky, though, is that you, go, you guys go up in age, uh, up in ABV as it goes through because there's less water in the air. In mm-hmm. Scotland, we've got one other consideration, which is not only is the cask going to be empty, it's is it above 40% ABV to allow Ooh. us to bottle it. So the, uh, the Provost Gig 45-year-old is 40.3%. Well, we so were aiming one for of those. a fifty-year-old. Yeah, we were aiming for a fifty-year-old, and then we tasted it, and we were like, "Oh no, no, this needs to be bottled now," because you can lose about two point point two percent in the bottling stage as well. So we were like, "This has to go yes, into bottle right there immediately." You kept, so you this, kept it barely legal. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so yeah, that was uh, that was a 1966 Bunahaven, which was the sister casks of um, the old acquaintance, which has been like a cult Bunahaven for a really long time. Wow! Um, how much? How much would that go for? That was 1,200 pounds, and you can still get it these days. So you know, it's a lot of money. But then on the flip side of that, it's a 45 year old Bunahaven. Oh so no, of course. And then for my question, like of that one, how many bottles were produced? For example, uh, so that that was five sherry butts, um, which you'd expect. You know, so a sherry butt, we're looking at five hundred liters. So you'd expect to have got maybe after forty-five years, there was probably about a thousand, thousand five hundred bottles of that. I can find wow. out exactly how many. But waited that that wait that long to get that amount. The tiniest, tiniest oh, amount. It's crazy. It's crazy. See, so obviously, the older we go with Port Skeg, the less uh, the less whiskey there is. But also, one of the things that we have to take into account with Port Skeg is, you know, the Elixir Distillers has been bottling independent whiskey since two thousand and three, two thousand and four. So, if we were only buying new make from then, the oldest whiskey we'd be able to release is a sixteen or a seventeen year old. So, a lot of the business, um, especially with with most indie bottlers, is having a steady supply of casks of the right quality. Mm-hmm. So, occasionally. So the Portis Gig 28, for example, we found four casks of that that were on a pallet of stock that we bought. Um, and it just said Isla Single Malt. No idea which distillery it came from, no idea whether it was Lafroy, Glagavulu, but it was all the same single malt. We knew that. Um, and a lot of people, so most people at the office were like, this is definitely Lafroy. So bottling a 28-year-old Lafroy. Um, and we sold that for about 280 pounds. You can still find it now. If you look at the Lafroy 25, it's about 550. Lafroy 30 is about 800. So one of the benefits of being an indie bottler is that, you know, we can find these casks sometimes. And because people didn't know what it was, we can be like, okay, well, we can put it out at this price. Yeah, and so you yeah. have the benefit of being able to try lots more interesting whiskeys as well. So yeah, the Portskeg range is, is vast. I mean, we've done 15-year-old unpeated, 12-year-old sherry casks. We've done a 10-year-old anniversary release. Um, and then there's individual um, casks that will go to different countries as well. So Belgium had um, a 1997 Kulila cask that was bottled just for the Belgian market. And then that kind of happens in the US as well. So it's, it's a wow. fairly inclusive brand. There's, there's a lot of different things you can taste at Portskeg. But it will always have the same you know, drinkability, it should always be at a really affordable price point for the quality and it should always be really approachable at the same time. Huh. Yeah, my mouth has just got watery of thinking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where does the name uh, Portis Gate come from, Nathan? Uh, Portis Gate, it's, uh, it's the name of like, the main port on the island. So when we were shopping around, or when Zakinda was shopping around for, for names, this was before I was legally allowed to drink, um, he was kind of looking at what would be the best thing to call, you know, the brand that, you know, kind of showcased an entryway, a nice kind of easy first bit or first kind of experience of Isla. And that happens as soon as you step off the boat. So if you get the, the Calmac ferry from Kenna Craig, which is what most people do, you know, three and a half hours on going through the Hebrides, and then you get to Isla and it's almost like time stood still there. So you kind of get there, you know, like, oh, it's really quiet. It's really calm. And then you look around and then you see a massive distillery spewing smoke over in the corner and that's Kulila. Uh, and then you kind of go around to all the other places. But Isla is a, it's a really amazing, quiet thing. So naming the whiskey Port Skeg was trying to encompass what people feel when they first get off the boat on Isla and to try and reference that in the whiskey that's produced as well. So approachable, awesome. fun, easygoing. Perfect. And um, why would companies choose? Uh, why would companies choose to bottle another people's whiskey? So this this is a question that I get a lot. 
and a, like people kind of go, so you're cheating, right? You're, you're buying someone else's product and you're, you're bottling. bottling it under your name. Yeah. And I guess in a way it is kind of cheating, but there's also, you know, an understanding from distillers and distillery owners that they cannot use everything that they bought, they, they make. So for example, Kulila, like we said, 6 million liters a year. Diageo don't need that much Kulila for their blends. So they rely heavily on the business of selling this off to other blenders or selling it into indie bottlings. Now, one thing so, that... So this, this is kind of like a, these would be considered like private labels? Exactly. Or, or yeah. something well, like kind, that? Oh, wow. Kind of. It's, it's kind of like, like in the US a few, maybe like five, six years, no, probably about 10 years ago, remember there was like the rye shortage. And then all of a sudden mm. you had these brand new distilleries that had like eight-year-old rye. Like, but you guys have just yeah. started distilling and everyone was buying it from MGP. Yeah. So it's the same thing. You buy the alcohol and then you do what you want to it. I mean, this is the key thing with the indie bottling. It's you can age it however you want for the, the amount of time that you want to age it. You can blend it however you want. If we look at the bigger distilleries, so like Glenfiddich, for example, Glenfiddich 12 has to taste like Glenfiddich 12. The 15 has to taste like 15. The 21 has to taste like 21. So imagine you're like working in the warehouse at Glenfiddich and you taste a 16 year old single cast Glenfiddich and you go, oh my God, this is like the weirdest but most awesome Glenfiddich I've ever tasted. Like that might have to be blended out into other things because it's, it's so out there. And that's yeah. not just Glenfiddich. Every distillery has to be consistent, right? That's the whole point. So one thing that it's really cool to, to do with indie bottling is once we buy the liquid, it's up to us how we do it. So if we want to put Kulila into Sherry, then into Madeira, we can. But that doesn't fit with Kulila's kind of distillery house style. So that's why indie bottling has become such a good thing. But also, it's, you know, it's expensive to age whiskeys. You know, you're, you're not only losing money hand over fist, you're also paying rent and storage costs on these. Your yep. insurance costs are enormous. So a lot of distilleries don't want to age their stock past 20, 25 years because the return for the amount you get isn't worth it. Whereas if we're buying parcels and different casks all the time, occasionally we find a 25-year-old Bowmore or something in there. We're like, cool, we can bottle that. And it's, you know, it doesn't quite have the same provenance that it does coming direct from the distillery or the right storage or something like that but you get to play around a lot more. So indie bottling that's, is a really cool way to do it. That's very, very interesting because the, the cigar world has some, some sort of a, of a similar, right? Uh, that's why I mentioned the, the private label because like, you know, we have big customers here in the US, for example, that, you know, they want a cigar made by us, right? Um, and, but we refuse, we would have to blend that cigar for them. Even, even if they come with like, okay, I want something to be as close can you make me a, a Camacho Ecuador distillery, you know, with my name on it, uh, whatever, you know, Pennsylvania cigars or whatever it is. Uh, we're going to be, no, that's, we can't do that. You know, we'll, we'll do something similar to it, but we cannot have that same blend out there because we already have it, you know? Um, and it's, and it's, and it's funny because a lot of companies, so vertical integration, right? Um, <clears throat> for example, us at Camacho, we, produce about and this year given you know what 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 happened and 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 everything probably about if don't quote me on this but probably about 20 percent of what we produce right so we are vertically integrated to a point but the brand expanded so much when uh when it was revamped and and you know we we've almost tripled the uh, the the size of the brand that we just have to buy tobacco from other growers right and now these growers they're and we buy tobacco we don't want them we want the tobacco fresh right we don't want the tobacco aged or fermented whatever uh because we want to do that ourselves you know we have our techniques we have our way of doing it but yeah we buy tobacco from other growers that those growers sell to uh other manufacturers right uh um, david perez with the ecuador in uh with the connecticut in ecuador he sells to to a lot of people. He sells to us at Davidoff, at Camacho, and, and Camacho, the Camacho Connecticut has an Ecuadorian uh, Connecticut wrapper grown by David Perez, right? Um, but the way how we get it, and then the way that we ferment it and and we age it, it's 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 our own way of doing it. But yeah, we're not fully vertically integrated with Camacho. But it's funny that, that you mentioned that we would never allow anybody else to have the same blend 
uh, just with a different band on it. You know, I think I think it's uh, it's it just and every industry has its different tweaks, right, and ways of, of, of running business. But uh, at least in the cigar industry, which is a this size compared to the liquor industry, the spirit industry, uh, I I don't think our, our you know if something like that would ever get a you know get out there, it'll be like oh my god, I can just you know have a Connecticut and put the uh, George Ramy cigars on it. You know, it's 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 funny how uh, how vertical integrated and also you know in, in Davida, for example. We create the strains, right? These are these are, are, are created. They're they're modified and to where they're they're uh, you can't nobody else if they were to grab the seeds, they would not grow in their in their farms, right? And and I'm not the technical guy because that goes into the scientific uh, uh, way of things uh, when it comes to the Davidoff seeds and stuff. But I know that that in Honduras we also are trying to use some of those uh, methods to where it's only produced by us, right? And, uh, and and if those seeds were to get out there, nobody else could produce them. So that the vertical integration, it's the idea, it's there. It's just the Camacho consumes so much and that we just cannot produce enough in our in our small farm because it's uh, it, it produces only 20 percent of, of what we uh, what we consume as a company. Um, but the, our, our Corojo tobacco, that is our, our baby. That is what we produce the most. Right. We do have we do produce Criollo. We did a few tests with Connecticut as well. But mostly what our farm produces is Corojo tobacco. You know, so it, it's funny to, to, to see the, the, the comparison in, in, of both industries. Um, I think we'll move on to the uh, to the last whiskey, which is Teladu, which I believe is also Kalila. Am I correct? Uh, that's correct. Uh, so many of you would know that uh, Cigars actually produces uh, their own independent bottling as well under a brand called uh, Stella Du. So within the range, uh, we have a core range, which is a standard Speyside Highland, and we also have a, a Cigars Orchard Selection Malt. Um, which have been produced for a number of years. About three years ago, we started uh, releasing single cask uh, lines and we've done nine different variants. The latest one that we did is the Coolila as well. So because we're doing Port Ascade, which is mainly Coolila, we've uh, selected this uh, bottle that we've included in the samplers today. So this is a cask strength, so it's 60.4% ABV. So it's a little higher. Uh, than the, the previous two that we've just had. Uh, but they still have that uh, same characteristics. The, the peat is very soft, has those uh, floral sort of notes, quite soft on the palate. But you will notice the, the higher ABV if you, you sample these. So the, the range of uh, Stella Du um, is all multi-award winning uh, whiskies. Uh, last year, we actually won the Independent Bottle of the Year at the Independent Bottlers Challenge by the Whiskey Magazine which was uh, a, a great accolade. Uh, a selection of uh, whiskies that were created and selected by Ron Morrison and Mitchell Orchard. Uh, you can go and search online for all of these whiskies uh, on cigars.com. I uh, hope you'll enjoy it. Thank you. I think Anthony just put a link up for people who want to have a bit more information about uh, the Whiskey on the Cigars website. Um, kind of coming back to... Um, to, to, to Nathan for a second and talk about the uh, the Porter's Cake range because um, we tried the 100, uh, the Porter's Cake 100, but it's also 110, I believe. So 100, 110. I think the 110 was just for the US market because then that 110 proof there, it was just 55%. So it was the same thing, but 100 proof was different in the US to it was here. So the 110 is the same liquid, but just re-labeled uh, for the US market. Ah, okay. What, 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 what is the, 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 the limit here? 100? 110. So 110. you guys, in the US, you got 110, which would be 55%. 55%. Um, I think tax goes up exponentially once you get past 55% in the US. Wow. So importing it in becomes a lot trickier. <laughs> and what are the plans for, for Porter's Cake in the future? And, and, and for, for, for Isle maybe in general? So, Elixir Distillers, um, so we have Elements of Isla, Single Monster Scotland, and Port Skeg, they have plans to open a distillery on Isla. So they've got the site, they've had lots and lots of surveying and meetings, and they've drawn all the plans up. They're just waiting for final planning permission to actually break ground. But the Isla's council, which is Butte and Argyle, um, it's, it's a lovely little council. It's very, very small, um, which means that it takes a lot longer to get things done. 
And obviously Isla is so pristine and so beautiful. They're very protective over, you know, how things are done and sort of house styles. So the design that we submitted for the distillery, there was some pushback because it didn't look like all the other Isla distilleries. So the, the residents of Isla and the, the council wanted something that was, you know, big white wall, black letters saying everything on it. Our distillery plans were a little bit more modern. Right? If you search um, Elixir Distillers distillery plans, you'd be able to see kind of what it looked like. It was a much more modern style of distillery. Um, so we're still working on that. Coronavirus has obviously put that on hold a little bit because not everyone's going to Isla and surveying the and trying to break ground. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that's that's kind of long-term goals for Elixir Distillers, um, getting set up with the distillery and then producing single malt whiskey on Isla is definitely um, the thing that Sakinda's always wanted to do and has been leading up to this for a long time. But within the other ranges, we're kind of just plowing on. So we keep spending lots of money on casks and we keep bottling lots and lots of different styles of whiskies um, in the Elements of Isla range. Um, we have got new releases coming out every sort of six months, normally October and April for the whiskey show. Um, and we also have Port Skeg releases coming out whenever Ollie Chilton decides he's ready to release one, to be honest. He's like, oh, we've got a gap in the bottling line here. Let's put this through. And we've now got a 19-year-old Port Skeg. And then the next week, we might have a 16-year-old. So myself and Sam, who basically run around trying to How many sell this product offerings? Room. How many product offerings do you guys have? So because they're quite limited, um, they're only on the market for maybe the elements of Isla. It'll oh, be so they, can, they get replaced they get and it's, they're like they, limited editions. And they exactly. Get, but you have, do you guys have a core? So the core range for Port Skeg is the 8 and the 100 proof. And then above that, we'd normally do a limited edition, which is a slightly larger limited edition. So you probably about 10,000, 15,000 bottles. Uh, above that, it's sometimes batches of four or five casks. Sometimes it could be 30 casks. So this is kind of the fun thing and it keeps us on our toes because we're constantly having to adapt what we're yeah. selling. We'll yeah. always have the eight, That's always have the 100 proof. And then you're yeah. just kind of, you know, floating around being like, cool, so we've got the 28-year-old, we've got a 24-year-old coming out, there might be a 39-year-old at this release, but not coming out over there. So the plans are to just keep putting out really exceptional liquids. And unfortunately, it does sell out, but it becomes one of those kind of, not cult whiskies, but something that people are always very excited about, especially with the Single Watch of Scotland, the Port Skates, the Elements of Islas. People know that when Ollie chooses a cask and chooses to blend it together or chooses to release it, it's always of amazingly high quality. So that's kind of the main goal for us. So we'll keep plugging away and keep bringing out delicious whiskey as often as we can, as often as people want awesome. it. Awesome. Awesome. Which one is your favorite, your, your personal favorite out of the range? Oh, I'd probably go with the 100 proof. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of like your kids, right? You're not supposed to have a favorite, but you yeah. do. <laughs> um, so yeah, the 100 proof is one of those where I think it has everything. It's got you know, really, really integrated peat. It's got a really nice, subtle kind of seaside note to it. It's got an amazing texture. It works great in cocktails as well. So if anyone's into cocktails, you like your old fashions, Manhattans, whiskey sours, this is kind of a really perfect whiskey to go with it. And also because it's high ABV, you can water it down to whatever you want. You know, you can bring this down to Port Skeg eight-year-old strength if you want, or you can just keep it super high. I like this drink, um, a summer highball with this. So you have, you know, 35 ml of this topped up with soda water and ice and a couple of sprigs of mint, and it's just super refreshing. So yeah, I would, I would say the 100 proof for sure. I mean, that's the one I drink the most of, which probably says more about me than, than it should, but... Wow. It's, um, it's a pretty tasty whiskey. And like I said, affordability on it, I think is for a cast strength Isla whiskey, it's a really, really well-priced dram as well. So that would be my Speak, pick. Speaking about old, old fashions, what, what a world would be when, with, with your whiskey and a smoked Corojo old fashioned, right? That's what we should a do. A little bit of cigar. Yeah, that's, that's that. And it, 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 that came to mind because uh, we're working on a, uh, we just recently launched a, a cookbook yeah, the ball Camacho. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. The, for, for Camacho, the cookbook, right? And then it just all the ideas have been, you know, coming in. And we were talking to one of the, the chefs. And actually, uh, yesterday, it, just the idea got reinforced. We were uh, talking to uh, Chef uh, uh, Thomas Keller. Um, uh, just class had his, uh, has, uh, has his, uh, you know, his Facebook Live with him. And he was talking about, and we've tried it before, of throwing tobacco leaves 
into the uh, the the smoker the on the on the you know charcoal basically, right? So he he says that he he would sprinkle the uh, the charcoal with uh, with smoked tobacco, and then he made, I think it was smoked mushrooms, caviar, whatever with smoked tobacco, and I'm like, wow, I tried it before. I, I may have put a little too much tobacco in it, <laughs> but uh, but just the idea of infusing, you know, uh, just a, a, an old fashioned, for example, with uh, with tobacco and it smoked tobacco, it's 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 outstanding. I, I I tend to do that when I when we go down to Honduras uh, on Camp Camacho, eh, I I do you know I smoke your bourbon basically. It's the name that I that I gave it, right? So basically, it's uh it's, it's you have your bourbon, right? People grab your their cigar. Obviously, it has to be a very personal thing. You grab and you put your your smoke inside the uh, the your your glass and you cover it up yeah. and you and you leave it there for about sixty seconds, right? And that, believe me, that tames whatever whatever you know spirit you have in there. In this case, would be bourbon. It tames it in a way to where it's like it it brings down all of those 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 pungent notes that some people may like. But it, we're talking about a pairing, right? And uh, and and just it it it. it you sm- it's literally the word says it all it's smoked bourbon you know um and and my next probably this weekend i'll try throwing a couple corojos in the uh in the fire to see what they do to my uh my uh my uh my tomahawks uh but just the, the infusion of it and then you know it, a, a smoked corojo old-fashioned i think would be a, a great idea for those that want to you know experiment into the uh, the cocktail world Still think what they did at some point in um, in in Switzerland. They did a um, a commercial barbecue where they ate steaks in um, in Corojo leaves for for thirty days before putting it on a barbecue. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, huh. wow, That's disgusting. George, can I just ask you, just changing the subject, what's the um what's the production situation currently in Honduras? Because we've heard lots of rumours that it's dramatically reduced due to coronavirus. Hmm. I mean, it was it, it 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 came to a stall, right? Because obviously we, we produce. I mean, I, I see it on the board whenever I go down there. Anywhere from, you know, eighty thousand to one hundred twenty thousand cigars a day, right? Wow. So if we're if we're off a week, then that's a lot of cigars that were not produced. Um, but it, it that lasted a, a very short time, and we were able to you know kind of adapt to the the rules to their, the, the equivalent of the CDC down in, in Honduras uh, to where we were able to reopen the factory quite a while ago. Now, right now, we are feeling some of those lags, right? Because I, I called the office today. I needed a couple of boxes of Connecticut. They're like, no, the container is delayed. Like, we did not have a Connecticut Churchill. It's coming this, next week. But at, at right now, we did not have Connecticut, uh, uh, Camacho Connecticut Churchill, which that is our best-selling cigar. So you have those, those little delays. But, uh, but no, it's, 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 it's mostly delayed, uh, uh, you know, a couple of weeks at that, yeah, at most, uh, which is understandable given the circumstances. But no, the, the factory was, uh, which it's been, you know, back up and, and, and running uh, 100%, obviously, with, with all the uh, the, 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 the the rules and the, the procedure, everybody gets the temperature check and, and all that stuff. And we also have our doctors on, on, on premise as well. Um, but no, the, the factory was closed and that was one of our main concerns <clears throat> once this thing spread globally, right? <clears throat> that, uh, that the factory was going to be closed for a while. But no, it lasted, it lasted a while, uh, I would say probably a good three weeks to a month. Uh, but we, we had, you know, some stock that we were able to, to, so, so pretty much we, we, we had what we were expecting, but uh, now is when we're, we're feeling a little bit of, uh, of some of the back orders, but the back orders are going to be, uh, you know, a couple of weeks or so because we, we had to crank up the volume uh, in, in terms of production at the factory uh, right away once we got back to work. So uh, it, it kind of to balance it out, you know, um, but no, it's, it's not, it, it, it happened. You know, we did, we do have a, a couple of back orders and stuff, but you know, for the most part, uh, the factory is back up and running and, and we just don't, don't, you know, the, the consumer is not going to feel that, that, that delay. Right. Uh, if you're the guy that sells, you know, 200 boxes of Corojo a, a week, uh, Sure. Yes, you'll you'll probably be like, okay, I I got a hundred this week. You'll get a hundred next week, type of thing. But for the most part, it did not disrupt our our, our sales. Uh, it just disrupted a little bit of, uh, of 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 the back order uh, sense of things. But no, the the factories it, it it's back up. It's 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 open. 
um, everybody with masks and everything. And <clears throat> one of the reasons why we uh, we we cancel Camp Camacho for you know obviously uh, because it, we it was impossible for us to put our factory at risk, right? Because if we were to bring that one person that unfortunately was to have it or got it or whatever, and then to infect our factory, that is just a big no-no for us, right? So we were able to control it, you know, in a, in a micro way at the factory. But if we kept bringing people in, uh, that was just, it, it was just impossible, right? So, so we were able to contain everything. Um, I don't have any knowledge of anybody, you know, having COVID at the factory or, or, or any problems that have arise from uh, how we manage the situation. So no, the, the factory is back up, it's running. Uh, we're a hundred percent in production. So I, you know, it's, uh, it, it didn't affect us as much. Great. Good to hear. Mm -hmm. Thank God. I think Toby, you wanted to share something. Oh, well, I had loads of uh, very exciting and, and altogether very clever things in my mind, but all of them gone, except that Nathan said they're building the distillery. And I would like to remind everyone that a very big company called McAllen, by the way, it's an even bigger company behind that, just put a, it looks like a new spaceship, basically, at the distillery, uh, with some grass on top. It's very, very sweet. It cost about 120 million pounds, if I'm right. Oh. And... You know, Nathan works for a company I work a lot with, and Dawn and all, all the are a really good friend, and I have loads of respect for them, because my wife's an architect, so I know ex a little conservatory sometimes, a little extension is a pain in the bloody neck. So doing the distillery is definitely a thumbs up. But more importantly, this cigar is brilliant, because I have some people keep telling me, like, tired with these new old cigars, they don't have a big build-up. I'm sick and tired of that nonsense, because this... The, I know I always smoke them down very well. well I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you, man. Happy days. <laughs> and the build-up on this, the kind of toasted uh, peanuts and toasted almonds, it's absolutely gorgeous. That's what I'm looking for. And, and it's, it's absolutely perfect with a slightly smoky whiskey. So well done on that. Because peaty whiskey and cigars, I always say that that could be quite risky. But this worked out very well. So thank you, guys. Brilliant. This pairing went well. That's awesome. That's very glad. Uh, I've got one more question for uh, for George um, about the distillery edition. Uh, could you say that there's a there's a Connecticut, there's a Corojo, and uh, and Ecuador. Um, Corojo why, and Ecuador. Yeah, why is there no Criollo? Why, why is there no Criollo? No, so Criollo, <clears throat> in our pyramid, right, sits at the bottom of uh, of the of the pyramid, right. You would think it's a Connecticut, but no, I, 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 and we're in a private chat, so I like to call it Connecticut a Connecticut with balls, right. Because it does have a nice creamy wrapper, you know, that covers it. But what's under the hood, uh, it's this bold tobacco, right? And I explained the, the primings and all that stuff. So it's mostly higher uh, up in the plant tobacco, right? So the Criollo, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's one of those products that it's a love-hate situation, right? Uh, some people love it because it does have some sort of that, that Cubanesque feel and that flavor profile that people are looking for but it's on the uh, on the milder side right even though it has a nice you know Creole 98 fourth priming that right there that fourth priming for most of us cigars pretty much all of them aside from the Criollo our wrapper is fifth priming right which is the best part of the plant for the Criollo and we actually you know just dis disclose it it's a, it's a fourth priming so it's it's lower on the plant so it's less intensity so whatever process we were going we were we would you know going to uh, apply to this cigar in particular it would have overpowered it right um that's the main reason why the the our market share with uh, with connecticut obviously being our best seller corojo and ecuador it's way bigger than uh, than our criollo market share so yeah we would have we it would have Look nice to make it even, you know, four of our core, but uh, in terms of sales and 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 you know uh, uh, consumer perception, I think it would have been an overkill. You know, Criollo will leave it as it is out there, but uh, but yeah, it's 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 it just it wouldn't have fit in, you know, unfortunately, just because of the blend being so 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 tamed and 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 and, and so mild, basically, you know, because the the Criollo, the Criollo it's a, uh, uh, you guys do have that the Criollo in the yeah. UK, right? Yeah. It's uh for those of you guys that have smoked it, it's a, it's it looks you know dangerous, but it's just a, a you know you you can pet it you know basically uh, and and so so this 
process and this 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 project would have not fit in and i think uh, uh we did uh, obviously if we could have not left our corojo out of the the game uh it's our, our it's in our dna basically in this being a, a honduran Euro, uh, full production from our farm, um, it, it, it fit right in. And also the, the Ecuador, because the Ecuador is one of those that fill a gap that Camacho didn't have, right, uh, in terms of the flavor profile. And it was just, you know, adequate to, to, to add it to this process. So I think, I think the trilogy of these guys uh, did a great job. Unfortunately, like I said before, you guys don't get the other two, but if you get a chance, try them out. Uh, I, think, I think this worked best. The Criollo is just, it's just that, that, to fill in that gap in the portfolio, right? But uh, but it just doesn't get the love that that we would love it, you know, uh, to get. But it's just you know the the and and that that's the one that used to be the it's, it used to be called Havana before Camacho Havana, um, and we renamed it to Criollo. Uh, but it just you know it, it just it, it didn't it didn't work out. I I I, I don't think it, it was even considered because Criollo it was created or it was brought in when we did the revamp to to sit at that at, at the at the bottom of the pyramid, right? Uh, also, to you know, compete with, with price point, Korea was usually a little bit less than uh, than than Ecuador and also some of the other ones. So, uh, it, just to kind of you know compete in, in the lower price point cigars. So that's that's why just the Korea didn't make sense. All these other three are are, are the same price point uh, throughout all three of them. So with the late hour, they did uh, a limited edition uh, Petit Panatella uh, early this year. Uh, how do you think the distillery would? I saw that. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't. I haven't tried it yet, but I did see that. Uh, yeah, it wasn't would, available in the US. Yeah, um, that's the thing. I don't think it was available. Well, sometimes we get some goodies from uh, from overseas, but uh, that one I haven't tried it yet. Well, how, how do you think uh, the distillery edition would uh, translate into uh, machitos? Uh, because of this, because of the machitos being a a hand rolled product, right? Um, and we're staying true to the blend, the amount. So if we were to use, I don't know, let's just put it out there, 33% of the blend, right, on in the filler of the Connecticut, for example, mm -hmm. being that, that Corojo uh, aged tobacco, the equivalent to the Machito would be a, 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 a thing this big, right, in terms of uh, the tobacco. So at that point, given the time that we gave it that piece of tobacco would not be strong enough to overpower or to shift any any flavor flavor profile in the blend so the machitos uh uh i don't think and then and, and funny enough like there's no machitos ecuador no. right uh so that's one of those worlds where it's like yeah there's machitos criollo uh, connecticut and corojo but no ecuador um so i i, I don't think that's such a small cigar and in fact that uh, it's funny because the other day we had a, a at the beginning of the year i was able to do three of the trips of, of camp camacho and we were in the factory and then somebody's like hey where where are the machitos i'm like whoa uh i, I i've never seen him like where, where do we make him <laughs> there's only a small corner of two sets of rollers and bunchers that make machitos all day long right so so it's it's it's, it's they have to make these tiny cigars yeah. You know, and it's wrapper, binder, and filler, right? So it's the whole process, and it's just so small, you know. And I was very able to see them produce machitos, you know, like probably almost like two a minute, you know, because they were so small. Uh, but it's just that the size of it, we would not be able to, we would not be able to, 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 you know, deliver the flavor profile that we have sure. created on these other three. That's that, that's that's just the the only reason why. So how many machitos do they make a day, roughly? Oof, I just know the amount on the wall because it is just, I, I, I mean, I would have to get back to you with that. Yeah, with that. I, I know I can call a factory like right now and then they'll tell me, but um, I would have to get back to you on that one. I, I, I'm not quite sure, but I know that for sure, you know, anywhere from 70 to 110,000 cigars uh, uh, a day we produce. Yeah. I, I assume the Machitos is probably, I don't know, a 5% of that because yeah. Machitos, even though it's it, the amount you know they can make them quicker, but it's not a product that sells a lot, right? Uh, a, a a a Toro format will sell more than you know two tins of machitos, basically, uh, and then that's just a, the reality of things, you know. But I, I'm not quite sure how many machitos we produce, and also it's 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 it's, it's seasonal, right? It's it's one that we produce it, we make a, a X amount that was forecasted, it was sent out, and then 
however the inventories on that stand hey we need to make more you know what i mean because it's not that the factory produces an x amount uh, sure. uh yearly and then the, just this product that gets shipped out to either you know the switzerland or 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 germany or the us or distribution points and it just sits there right so it's all forecasted so it, it, it kind of depends but but it represents a very small amount of our daily production per day especially during uh covid um here in the uk the machitos have seen a, a big increase in sales uh, yeah i mean it's so just it's the abundance of time now absolutely yeah absolutely. <laughs> the abundance of time absolutely and we, we we've had periods where we we couldn't buy against it as soon as they came in they were gone again and then switzerland was out of stock and we, we had to buy them from belgium and reapply yeah. the means and yeah that's uh, yeah no but the, but the machitas are always it's uh it, it they've been around for a while now i don't know if at some point we'll, we're going to come out with the camacho cigarillos right which it was even smaller uh, uh format uh i'm not quite sure we still have Camacho cigarillos with the old packaging, right? So okay. I don't know what the deal is with that, uh, uh, but I know that that, that 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 we still have some very minimal quantities. Of course, so I'm, I'm not sure how how they're being distributed, but uh, yeah, that that is one that we just haven't you know gotten a chance to Enter, revamp yeah. and, and bring back yeah. because it just it's it's it represents such a small uh, part of of our sales, right? Uh, we want to pretty much focus on, on, on what makes the company a healthy company in terms of sales and whatever the consumer wants as well. You know? yeah. Perfect. Um, does anybody have any questions for either um, George or uh, Nathan? Oh, right. I'm just going to mention, uh, we've got our social media promotion as well. So any uh, social media posts, uh, Anthony's going to post into the, the chat room some of the tags to use. And uh, we'll review those posts tomorrow. And we're going to give away a bottle of uh, Port Escape 100 proof and a bottle of uh, our own Stella Du Cool Isla um, tomorrow. And we'll announce those by the close of business tomorrow. So go, go to the chat rooms, pick up those uh, those tags. We, we should also put a Camacho tag in there, Anthony. And uh, I'll share whatever you guys send my way. Yeah, and we'll, we'll get those posted and shared. We'll send it to the US in case George wins. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll send you my address. No problem. <laughs> awesome. We'll have to send you a bottle of Kulaila from our own. Oh show. my God! Please, by all <laughs> means. We'll do. Perfect. So yeah, if you check the chat box, um, Anthony throughout the um, the call has also been posting uh, links to to the Stella Du and then the Portis Cake. Uh, and I also posted a link to uh, the Camacho Cookbook uh, where you can download it for free for those yes. people who are interested in that. So uh, it's quite yes. an interesting... And, and, we, uh, and we do have a... I can disclose this with you guys. We do have a contest starting the tomorrow, basically, which is a... a, a uh, and you guys are welcome to to share, you know, if, if you download the the, the, the cookbook and want to share it. Uh, unfortunately, it's a U.S.-based contest for legal purposes, unfortunately. Um, but, yeah, so basically we, we have a contest starting where, where you tag your Camacho Nicaragua picture with your grilling, uh, with your cookbook recipe or or your own recipe and uh, and also you'll be featured on the on the on the on instagram and facebook and all that stuff i cannot say that you're gonna win because it'll be a lie you know it's all it's only for the u.s but you guys will see that interaction uh of uh of of, of the cookbook and the, this new contest going and i also have prepared formatted the uh the recipes in uh story format as well so it's just easy to just you know screenshot and you have the recipe uh on your phone great um, well, we've done uh, pretty much an hour and a half. So I think uh, it's been a very good session. Thank you, George, for your for your time and also Anytime, your, my man. your knowledge and uh, and enthusiasm about Camacho. Um, Anytime. Also, Nathan, um, thank you very much for, for explaining the whiskies and more, more, than, more than welcome. That's what it's going to do. Uh, very interesting for for a lot of people, I think. Um, so yeah, as uh, Paul said, I will send the link uh, to this um, call later to uh, to Paul, so it will be on the. Uh, she goes a uh, YouTube channel, I believe, uh, after yep. it's edited. So, uh, so you can look back and uh, pick up some things you might have missed. And I think I don't know if uh, Paul or Mitchell want to share anything at the end to finish us off. No, just my thanks to Nathan and George. Uh, very interesting session for me. Uh, so, thank you very much. More than welcome. Absolutely. Thank pleasure. you for having us. Much appreciate it. Thank you, everyone.
And well done, Thank Sam. Guys. Right. Enjoy the rest of the evening, guys. Thank you for, yes. for joining Good us. Hi, guys. Thank right. you. Take care. Good luck. All right. Thanks, Nathan. Live loud. Have a good one.